Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Eating While Broke. I'm your host, Colleen Witt, and today we have very special guest, Fizz, in the building, recording (laughs) artist, actor. Most of us all know you from your multi-platinum selling group, B2K. Yes, ma'am. It is an honor to have you here today. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, and of all calls you get, it's the call of, hey, come and make a broke dish. <laughs> Were you like, what? No, nah, yeah, for a minute I was like, what do you mean a broke dish? Like something not put together? Or I'm like, take me then, back to that time. Yeah, when you explained it, I said, oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you hit yeah, me yeah. with uh, t- two unique dishes. Mm-hmm. But this one has never been done on the show. So tell me what you're going to have me eating today. All right. So today we're going to take um, the famous Frito lay bag, Fritos, mm-hmm. original corn chips. Mm-hmm. And we're going to pop in a, a pot some hormel chili. Okay. We're going to heat that joint up. Mm-hmm. And then we're going to melt some cheese in there. Mm-hmm. And we're going to pour it in the, the, the Frito bag. Uh, and we're going to mix it up, and we're going to have chili cheese Fritos. This sounds really dope. I've never, ever had this. So I was, you, you heard me. I was really excited. I was like, wait, what? Yeah, that's what we're going to go with. Um, This sounds like something you'd eat like after school. Yo, so the way this came about was I used to, me and my friends after school, we would always go to Westchester Park mm-hmm. uh, and just play ball. It was an open gym there. So... Of course, you know, we didn't have no money as kids. Mm -hmm. We have like some change in our pocket. And um, the ice cream truck used to pull up and he would have these small bags of Fritos Mm -hmm. and chili and cheese that he made. And he would just dump a little bit in there and give us a plastic spoon. And we mix it up like nachos. Oh, so that's how. Okay, okay. I didn't even know that. I wonder if all the... Ice cream trucks sell that. I feel like in LA that happens. Yeah, I don't so, know about New York. But but then, you know, it transferred over to us leaving middle school to high school mm-hmm. and stopping at 7-Eleven, getting a bag of Fritos, opening it in the store, and then hitting it with the chili and cheese instead of doing nacho chips. Because oh. then you get more chips in the bag, yeah. you know? So and then I you could get fancy. And are like kind of big too. Yeah, you could get fancy at the 7 Eleven, throw some jalapenos on there too, you know what, what I'm saying? And then they just charge you like a dollar for the chili and cheese. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, I thought you guys were like, Kind of sneaking it. I mean, yeah, that was the <laughs> initial thing, you know. <laughs> then they were like, nah, kids, you're going to pay a dollar. <laughs> okay, well, go ahead and, and whip up this chili, so Frito, we're gonna start. chili. What do you call this? Fritty, Frito, I'm, chili, chips? My name is the Frito Bang. The Frito Bang. Yeah. Okay. Because like you whip the Frito up with a little shebang, you know what okay. I'm saying? So it's the Frito Bang. The Frito Bang. Yeah, yeah. Teach so, us. Yeah. Teach us. Gonna Take pop, us to school. We're going to pop open this can of chili, right? Mm-hmm. And now you don't add any seasoning or anything. I mean, if you really want to get fancy like that, but we talking about being broke. So when you yeah. broke, you ain't got no seasonings. Mm-mm. You know what I'm saying? You got to work with what you got. Wow. And you guys just, you guys took this from the ice cream truck and you just, how'd you find the can of chili? How'd you get onto that? Well, it was down the street from my house. I stayed on Slauson. Mm-hmm. And, uh, oh, you got to turn that bad boy. It was... Uh, a grocery store down the street called the Buddha Market. It's still there. Mm-hmm. And the Buddha Market, this was the chili they gave us. You know what I'm saying? This is our option, the chili. <laughs> I'm going to take a little bit of this water. Give me a little. Mix it up. With, look at a little soupy. You know what I'm saying? I guess I can use this spoon. And you're, from, you're an L.A. native, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I was born in New Orleans. So I got that Creole in, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? I, be, I could really throw down. We was really cooking and we wasn't on no broke shit. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I can make some real some real fire up in here. But um. So if you didn't have to cook a broke dish, what dish could I expect from a good, like if you were trying to impress me, mm-hmm. like what would you do to, what meal would you cook for me? Um, Well, first I would ask, do you, are you- Allergic to anything? Yeah, allergic Nothing. to anything. Okay. Do you like spicy food? 
Not really. Not really. Okay, yeah. so I would probably bless you with like some. I love how you said bless you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. you in the kitchen? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would bless you with some chicken and shrimp pasta jambalaya. How long would that take you to cook? Mm, I'm quick, so I'll probably fix that up in like an hour. No way. Yeah. Damn, we should have had a special edition for you. <laughs> <laughs> so take me back to what was going on during this era. Like, take me all the way there so I could be there with you during this broke era. Um, we in middle school, high school? What's yeah, going on? I would on? say mostly middle school. High mm -hmm. school is early B2K, you okay. know, so I was on the road at that time. But high uh, middle school, you know, I would catch the bus home. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, I stayed right there off Slauson and like over here. Mm -hmm. um, so right there, I mean, we used to have Yee's Cafe. I mean, Yee's Chinese restaurant. We had uh, Sachi's teriyaki, mm -hmm. teriyaki uh, chicken bowls. Um, we had another little Mexican restaurant right there. But, you know. What was your home life looking was like? Was it like a single mom, two parent yeah, household? Single mom. Single mom. Yeah. And then what did your mom do? She, like, as far as work. Mm -hmm. um, like she, how did she support y'all? She canceled, counseled at a junior college, West Los Angeles Community College. Okay. She's a counselor up there. Well, she was. She retired. Uh, but, um, man, I got so many kids that used to see me and would be like, yo, you little fizz. And I'm like, yeah. They'll be like, Man, I know your mom. Like, she helped me through school. Tell Miss Frederick I said thank you. Bro. Uh -huh. Like, yeah. So, I used to be like, man, my mom's more famous in the hood than me. Wow. Because literally, like, everybody that knew me knew my mom. Because everybody was going to that school. See, it was bubbling. It was getting, that's it was that's getting supposed a to be. Warm. Okay, okay. That's how you know it's heating up. See that little smoke coming off of it? So, the kids in school, they would call you Lil Fizz. So, your name was Lil Fizz before? Nah, nah. Oh. I got the name in the group. Um, but you're saying after you was superstar B2K, they were still coming up to you about your mom? Yes. That's pretty awesome. Yes. <laughs> still to this day. Wow. I'll see people like, man, your mom helped me through school, man. If it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have went to this school and started working here. Yeah. She put a lot of people on. Like, So she was like very inspiring. Yeah. She was a counselor. Then she became head of the transfer center. So she started helping kids. Uh figure out you know all the credits and everything they needed to get to their desired university wow mm -hmm. and then did you have siblings or was it just you and, Me her? and my older sister okay so did you guys grow up with her busy busy because a lot of single moms i'm hearing that you yeah. like barely so, see my older sister she's seven years older so she played a big role in my life um most of the time um i can remember in elementary school my mom was working graveyard shift okay um for some computer computer company and uh it would be me and my sister i would come home times have changed man i would come home from the bus in the second grade by myself wow and do stuff like this <laughs> really yeah like so you learn learn how to cook like simple meals early yeah super early second grade Cups is what 10 uh how old is the second top grade? ramen all of that i was making mm -hmm. all of that super early but like i said my family was from new orleans so I had an uncle who showed me how to chop up green onions, take some uh, some hot sausage, cut them up, put some a couple of onion powder, garlic powder, mm -hmm. some garlic cloves, cut those up and put it in the um, in the noodles, and that'd be tasting like a whole different. It ain't regular top ramen, you know. What That's I'm saying? how you did your ramen. What crack? What fire? Damn, we should have had you a. Uh... Damn, you could do your own eating while broke special. <laughs> um, so you started with B two K kind of early. So uh, take me through, like, I guess how that transition happened from being raised in a single mom, you know, household with an older sibling that's seven years older, to you kind of getting signed right out of high school, or I'm guessing during high school. During right? high school, um, during our ninth grade year, actually. Um, ninth grade. Yeah. I didn't what finish, were you doing I didn't finish, as a kid? I, I didn't finish uh, the full ninth grade year. I checked out and started doing independent studies. So what were you doing that led to a record deal in the ninth grade? Like, I have to know what you were doing when your mama wasn't watching you. Um, well, we were, we'd be in rehearsal a lot, you know, as okay. a group. We were together in studio sessions, um, rehearsals, mostly, mostly rehearsal. 
and um, performing for different labels. So while well, you were a little kid, though, yeah. But who was helping you guide you when you're a little kid? Like obviously, you didn't just like. How were <laughs> I? I need to know how this group came together because I'm I'm so lost. So you were I so was, young. Yeah, I was young. I was eight years old when I joined the group. Um, was it like you and your friends? It was me, actually. A uh, friend of mine still to this day, Janae Aiko's older brother. Okay. His name, uh, Jahi. He was in the group. It was me and him were more of the original, like first two. We went through a lot of different members mm -hmm. until it got to me, Jahi, um, this other guy, uh, Trey, and Boog and Raz. Okay. And that group got split up because Sony wanted to sign us, but they wanted to sign just us three with another member and take the other two, Jahi and Trey, and put them in another group, which became Final Four. Oh, okay. Um, but so how did you guys even get like in front of the labels older. at that age? We had management that was that had originally put the group together, you know, was finding all the members. Um, a lady by the name of Keisha Gamble mm -hmm. and choreographer Dave Scott. Okay. They um, found us in all different places. I was at a... Uh, Black Hicks, uh, Black Expo, downtown LA. Okay. And um, my mom took me down there as a kid, and there was this group on stage, and I was looking at them. I was really into ABC, Crisscross mm -hmm. at that oh, time. Oh, I remember Crisscross. And Cross. they had on like the big jerseys and the mm -hmm. baggy jeans, and I was like, oh, they look tight. Mm -hmm. And then we walked off, and this lady came chasing behind my mom. She's like, "Excuse me, your son is so adorable. What's his name?" She started talking to me, and I was like, "Yeah, I'm Drew." And um, she was like, do you sing or rap? And I'm like, yeah, I rap. And she's like, oh, okay. And my mom's looking like, you rap? Like, <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> so uh, she called my mom uh, later on that week and invited me over to one of the group members' houses, which mm -hmm. happened to be Jahi, Janae Aiko's older brother. Mm -hmm. And I auditioned, I rap, and they liked it. They mm -hmm. put me in a group. I was eight. Wow. And um, yeah, we just, from that point, we got a lot of work in, you know, learning how to be an artist, rehearsals, um, media training, and so what. And, um, and at the age there, of the, starting at eight? Yeah. And from there, the group just kept developing. Different members um, would come in and out. You know, things weren't happening in the time span that certain parents were looking forward to happen for their kids. So they would take them out the group, we'd find a replacement, and that's how it all like formed to the five members and then split into B2K and Final Four. Okay, and then what was your mom's thoughts during this whole process? Um, my mom was like, yo, like, don't have your heart set on this. You know, she wanted me to finish school um, and live a normal life, you know, live a normal, grow up in the normal, what, mm -hmm. how normal kids do. Um, she didn't really see it. But I just, between the four of us, we had an idea on what this was really going to be. Like you were, you personally were really invested. Yeah, all, all four of us. As all a four. Group, you know, okay. we were destined on getting to where we saw ourselves. Wow. And I was being the biggest group in America. So. And you saw that from a young age. Yeah. And did you tell your mom that? Yep. And she wanted to take me out the group at a time. And I was like, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, nope, this is happening. And she was like, but you don't want to give up on your, you know, I wanted to play basketball. I mm -hmm. wanted to do the, you know, sports thing. She just felt bad. She was like, I, I don't want to, you, you know, discourage you or anything, but I still want you to have your, you know, your childhood, like prom, homecoming, yeah. graduating from high school. So when it happened, I just promised her that I would finish school. So I finished high school. I graduated um, from independent studies, but I graduated, got my degree. And it just worked. It worked how I seen it. But did you ever end up going to like prom and all the high school so stuff? So we did a MTV prom or something, mm -hmm. but it wasn't like a real prom. No. Okay. Do you feel like looking back that you missed out or? Not that I missed out because I got to experience what a Watch lot out. Of, that bad boy is hot. Okay. I got <laughs> to experience what, you know, 95% mm -hmm. of the world of kids yeah. don't. So um, I'm sure you were touring at a very baby age, right? Yeah. So, no, I don't regret it, mm -hmm. but, you know, now that, like, my son is here, 
I'm like, nah, I wouldn't let him do this. You know, I wouldn't oh, let really? him do entertainment unless it just was God sent for him to do it. Mm -hmm. But I want him to have that normal child life, you know? Okay. And so you kind of see now that you're a parent, like what your mom's perspective for was? For sure. For sure. Wow. You don't ever see it as a kid, you know? Yeah. All so, right, so this 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 chili cheese ready. We yeah, gonna crack it's open this bag. Right. So I open the bag. Yeah, yeah. So guys, just so you listeners are listening, he heated up the chili in the pot, threw some shredded cheese on top. We're opening the bag of Fritos. I've never had this, so this is going. It's very hot, and he's pouring it directly from the pot into the bag. Ooh, he he looks fire. like a professional, like he's been doing this his whole life. That's that fire, you know what I'm saying? Take that blicky right there. <laughs> Shake them on up. Got your fork right there ready? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, when you fill it in the bag right there, you know it's, oh, oh it's yeah. Oh, it's warm. Oh, yeah. Ooh, it's that, that's that. That's that blicky right there. So when you get about here, you're going to like... Start like, all right, I need some more. Then you can put more if you're oh. not. If not, if you, when you're done, you know, and you can go back to it. But yeah, yeah. Let me oh, let y'all see that. That looks really uh, gooey and messy and yeah, hot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, here we go. I got my first. I mean, this this looks crazy. I could imagine this is good, though. This is hilarious. Oh. <sighs> Yeah, get ready, because, you know, I don't know what this is doing to the stomach these days. You know what I'm saying? As an adult, this might not agree with me. Really? <laughs> I always get nervous about heating up beans in a can, just so you know. I, I never know how that's going to turn around for the stomach. Yeah, this is uh, this is eating while broke. All right, before we try, we're going to throw the commercial. Okay, so we're back. We got the bags rolled back, just the yeah, way yeah. Fizz is teaching me how to do this, so... I got it on my fork right here, steaming hot. Yeah, yeah, let me get a little bit with All you, right. you know what I'm saying? Here we go for the taste test. Come on. There we I got, go. Oh, there we go. There Ready? We go. One, two, three, let's go. Phenomenal. How you still don't do this? How I still don't? You can't do this every day now. You know, I'm not in my age. No, no, but you know what? The texture on this, this is this is Fire. awesome. The texture from the uh, crunch and then the melty gooey and the hotness. This is phenomenal. I don't know why I didn't know about this. <laughs> yeah, I had to put y'all on, man. This is that that real um, L.A. I would be eating this every day eating if I was a bro, kid. You feel me? Mm -hmm. All right, guys, I'm gonna stop eating in your ears, but this is, <laughs> I would kill this. This would be my everyday snack as a kid. Put you on. If we're ever on a call in the future and we see <laughs> you in the future. Okay, that's highly addictive, really good. And by the way, this meal was like three dollars, I think. Like seriously, yeah, yeah, like yeah, three or four dollars. Super cheap. Like for cheese, multiple but... servings, like it's like maybe five, but this is an amazing yeah, after school I, like, snack. This is what like, you know, if my son is having a sleepover and his boys is over and they want a snack, I can get the little bags of the Fritos, mm -hmm. make this, dump it a happy. little bit. Yep. They in there like, this is fire. <laughs> you like daddy of the year off this yeah 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 you know i got all the snacks let me tell you this is a great snack this is a great i don't even know appetizer slash meal <laughs> this is amazing so now your life your story is so unique because you're young um and you literally went to the promised land mm -hmm. which was pretty impressive so you're eight years old you're, you know, you end up signing a, in the ninth grade. So, like, let's talk about the signing day mm. and what was going on in your life, like what your schedule was looking like, what your home life was looking like, what your pockets were looking like before the deal. So, 
Um, in high school, ninth grade at the time, I started school kindergarten at four years old. So in ninth grade, I was 13. I was okay. super young. Um, we had, um, my schedule was a normal kid's school schedule. I played for the football team at the time. Um, was trying out for the basketball team. I made the team, but didn't ever get to go to the first practice because I had to check out before then. Okay, but your but your schedule also included like rehearsals and trainings, right? Not as much okay. while school was going on. Okay, um, more so on the weekends. Okay, um, because yeah, we were in school. We hadn't checked out just yet. Um, but prior to ninth grade starting, in uh, that summer. Uh, Prior to ninth grade, we we were together all the time. Okay. Did so, you guys go to the same high school? Mm -mm. None oh. of us. Now, did you tell your friends at school or your peers at school that you were doing this band yeah, thing? When and did I, they support it? When I came, I because I went to Bishop Montgomery. So it was a Catholic school. We had uniforms. So I came to school one day in regular clothes. I was checking out. And everybody was like, where you going? Where you going? I was like, yeah, I'm leaving. I'm about to be famous. They like, <laughs> yeah, right. What are you talking about? I'm like, yeah, I'm checking out. I'm about to be famous. I just got a deal. You know? <laughs> I think I'm trying to be real cool. Uh -huh. I used to wear a fake Rolex with a tape on it, <laughs> holding it together and stuff. So um, it was fun. You know, I, just, I remember that though, going there. And then we started to do like magazine covers and stuff, like mm -hmm. when Word Up was out. Mm -hmm. So then all of my peers and everybody at school was like, yo, you really are famous. Like you <laughs> in this group. Da, 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 da. So they had a homecoming that year, a homecoming dance. And my boy that went to school with me, he made me a, 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 a fake ID for Bishop. Mm -hmm. And I went to the homecoming dance. And when I went there, it was like, everybody was like, yo, oh my God, he's here. Like I was like, <laughs> I remember that. That was my highlight high school moment. Like, yeah, it felt like I had was like prom king or something. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, everybody was just all eyes on me at the school dance. That has to been pretty incredible feeling. Now, as because that was the first time, and the only reason why I'm trying to find this out was that the first time. But this is before you're really, really B2K, yeah, right? Yeah. So this is like. A it's snippet a, of what your yeah. life is about to be coming. Yeah. And you liked it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then what's the next milestone? Um, the next milestone would probably be like between you being signed, now you know, you're getting these interviews, your people are start you're starting to get all this PR behind you. Like what's the next not milestone before before money? Like more the fame, like what was that next transition like? When did you realize like, oh shit? Um, I would think it was when we first heard our song on the radio. We were in New York in like Times Square and we were about to do 106 in Park for the first time. That's a big show at the time. I would have been, and that's... It was the the car the song playing in the radio and on the radio in the car. It wasn't the one on Six and Park. Mm -mm. What? And because it, it was like, yo, we're actually on the radio. Mm -hmm. You know, that's like now it's like we got streaming apps and stuff, mm -hmm. so it's not like anybody can go put their song on the app and mm -hmm. you can hear it. Back then, to have your song on the radio it was like you made it. It was like, oh my god, mm -hmm. they're list the world is listening to us right now mm -hmm. on the radio. You know. So that was just a big, a big accomplishment and a milestone for us, for sure. Okay, and then the sh the song. What was the song at the time? Because I know uh -huh. all your songs pretty much just blew up. <laughs> no, I just remember "Be Too Gay" everywhere. It was uh huh. Oh, okay. Yeah, Tricky okay. Stewart. So your songs playing on the radio. You're doing these interviews. You're no longer in school. You're still in high school. And your mom is she on the road with you or is she nah. letting you? No, we on the road with world management. But she calling, you know, I'm making sure I do my part. See, my mom was, before she got the counseling job, she was a substitute teacher. She would sub in at different schools. So I never got a break, like, to just say, hey, fuck it, I ain't doing homework today. Or, you know <laughs> what I'm saying? It was like, did you do your work? What is it? Let me see it. Blah, blah, blah. So it was like, I, you know, school had to be done. Okay. Yeah. And then what are your pockets looking like during this 
rise to success? Um, well, we got our little advancement, which wasn't crazy. You know, most of it had to go into a trust account because we weren't 18, so mm -hmm. I couldn't spend it like that. And I think the first little money I had, I might have had like five grand to really touch. Mm -hmm. And I think I spent it all in the mall in like two weeks. <laughs> it was gone. Was just buy clothes and sneakers? Clothes, shoes, just everything you wanted, you know? Wow. It was like, I got money now. <laughs> two weeks it was gone. Did your mom know you blew it in two weeks? Um, Nah. Nah, see, my mom gave me access to really control my own money. Mm -hmm. Um, The money I could touch, mm -hmm. you know. Oh, so, so she didn't touch it at all. She let it be yours. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. A lot of parents don't do that. Nah, nah. And sometimes I'll be like, I wish she would have took all my fucking money. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Now when you handle your money, do you handle it different? Cause... 100%, especially because I have a kid, you know. Mm -hmm. Um. I always have to put something to the side for him. So when he, you know, whenever he's eighteen or something happened, you know, he's he's good. He's so, taken care of. Yeah. Yeah, I know that like now I feel way more parental responsibility after having a kid. I'm like, first of all, school tuition, priority over everything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Number one thing, you know? And now I'm like, okay, for future you know, generational wealth, house, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. trust. But luckily with social media now, I feel like even if you're not really the genius at parenting, like social media will have like a 30 second snippet on how you should be operating, <laughs> you know, right? how yeah. you should be handling your house and your real estate and your bank accounts for your kids. And if you say for this sure. and you see those snippets online. Yeah, well, all the time, all the time. All right. So back to your story. So you you get your five thousand. That's your first taste of money while being popular, right? Mm -hmm. Then what's the next milestone? Like when do you do you blow up and actually have money, a lot of money at the same time? Um, no, because like we were still under eighteen. Okay. So like I said, majority I know my money was going into uh, a trust account. Okay. You know, where I couldn't touch it till I was 18. Um, so it was just however really your parent worked it was how you was going to, you know, see your money. So I was maybe seeing only 10% of my money that I was getting. Good job, mom. Yeah, hey, I, I wasn't seeing a lot. So, okay. But um, then what happened when you turned 18? I went and got my crib. I went and <laughs> paid my car off. Okay. The responsible stuff you sh I should do at 18, you know. Okay. But then from there, it was like figuring it all out again okay. because I wasn't doing a nine to five. Mm -hmm. um, I did check back into school because mom, she was still at the junior college. So I was like, I think I was maybe like 24 and I checked back into school for well, like a year. But where was B2K when you were 24? Like I was, how? We were broken up. Before oh, we turned 18, we broke up. Oh, before you turned before 18? Before I turned 18, yeah. We broke up when I was 17. Really? But so when we was watching you on TV and all that, you was a little kid? Yeah, I was from 13 to 17. What? It's so weird because I think maybe because I was younger, I felt like maybe <laughs> you were older or something. No, 13 to 17. And then Love and Hip Hop came about mm -hmm. 2014. By that time, I was going on 30. Okay, okay. So you're in the so the band gets dismembered. You go back to regular life, but is regular life normal for someone that is a superstar? Hell nah. So <laughs> yeah, so tell me how that tra was that um, transition tough. I would say not. I didn't. It wasn't tough for me because I'm an introvert. Mm -hmm. I already don't like to be out. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather stay in the house. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just very secluded most of the time. Um, it wasn't until I had my son when I was 24 mm -hmm. that I like started to step out again and, you know, have to play the parent role. So now I'm meeting other kids, parents and, mm -hmm. and talking and being more social and out. Um, so that's what got me out of like my shell was having my son. But when the but, band dismembered, did you say you're going to stay in music or did you say- Well, we tried. I tried, but it was just so much 
politics and mm -hmm. people that we were dealing with that were keeping certain things in place to where we couldn't really do much. So um, I tried to do what I could, but yeah, it wasn't much. Did you end up trying to get a job or open a no, business? No, I was never going to get a job. That oh, wasn't. That was never going to happen. That was not. Nope. I'm like, no, I'm fizz. I'm not getting no job. I'm, I'm going to figure it out. What did your mom say when you were saying that? She just told me keep going. Yeah, yeah. She pushed the dream. You so know? how did you survive, I guess, from now, from that point? I mean, before Love and Hip Hop. I'm going to say okay, between so this before, and Love and Hip Hop. So 18 to 24. Mm -hmm. um, when I was 18. <laughs> now, you about to get a breakthrough story nobody ever really got. That's what I want. <laughs> help me. Yeah. Help me. Help you. Help me. But um, help me. Yes. Tell me. I did some I did some smart things, you know, um, with my money. But <clears throat> prior in those years, um, I started a business. I had a, a cannabis dispensary. Um, I had dispensaries uh, that whole time and even past that time. Uh, but yeah, that was my main like source of income. I had met a guy. Um, who really knew the business inside and out, and we were neighbors. And I had a little bit of money, and um, I was like, yo, I smoked at the time, mm -hmm. still do. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yo, I wanna start one of these. Like, mm -hmm. what? Like, what is this? Yeah. And he started showing me the ropes and everything. So we opened one together. And this downtown was when LA. was just. Yeah, this was freshers. 2006. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. I had a. Uh, I opened my first shop. It was downtown LA, me and him. Um, we had that one for about a year and some maybe two years and then opened another and another and, and another. And you guys were you guys was he part black too or was he no, white? No, this was a Jewish guy. Oh, Jewish guy. I mm -hmm. was gonna say because the the cannabis industry, there's rumors on the street that it's notorious a little bit slanted away from the blacks, like to get their licensing and being able well, to Well no, there's it. things that hard. came in place like you have the um um, what's it called? The uh, um, for minorities, uh, it's a license that's available for um, people who have been to jail for selling marijuana or no, trafficking marijuana. Um, yeah, the, I forget what it's called, man. It's been so long. But there is a there is a system that helps to get them 100%. into it. Yeah. Okay, yeah, because I remember thinking at some point, like, man, you got to think of how many people are doing this before it became legal. Oh, like, yeah. Like, all I, their I, experience. I ran into my, to my situations for sure because, you know, I mean, it came out in, what, 2012, mm -hmm. the one shop I had for, like, I had it for, like, three, four years. Mm -hmm. It was on Robertson. It was called Little Amsterdam. I had sold it to these other guys, and they never took it's part of my fault. I never got the lease out of my name. Mm -hmm. So when the city came down on them and raided them and everything, mm -hmm. it came back on me because the building was in my name. Oh, wow. So, yeah, it was all on TMZ and everything. Lil Fizz caught selling marijuana. <laughs> I'm like, Jesus Christ. I'm like, yeah. But, yeah, um, that was that was mainly what I was doing for like, So you were an entrepreneur. Time. And you, were, you weren't just an investor. Like, you were hands-on. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, people would see me in the shops like, bro, what you doing in here? Yo, you the plug. <laughs> I'm like, nah, man, this is business. Did they try to but get they didn't see it you? like that back then. Like now you see it and you see it and you respect it as a real business, you yeah. know? Back then it was like everybody felt like I was just trapping. But I'm like, man, I'm putting money <laughs> into this. You yeah. know what I mean? Like I went and got seller's permits, mm -hmm. things with my name when that let you know I was really doing it, yeah. you know, aside from not being able to have a business license per se, yeah. but I was still trying to do it as legal as I could. Yeah. Know? And the, is there a reason why the life expectancy on those businesses was, to me, they sound a little short because it's like you said, one year or four years or five because years? Because at that time, it had no federal guidelines. It mm -hmm. was legal with state, but not federally. Mm -hmm. So once you got too big, like I remember a shop I had downtown got so big, I got a letter from the U.S. attorney telling me to close or they were going to send the DEA in in two weeks to raid me. What? So I thought, but I thought it's still not legal on a federal level because I heard that that's why those shops can't have bank accounts, right? 
Yeah, so many loopholes in it now. I, oh. I'm out of it now. Okay. What but... made you end up closing up shop in the end? <laughs> <laughs> she how... said, give me the answer. <laughs> I have to know. when um, Anytime an entrepreneur walks away from a business or an industry, you have to wonder, like, what yeah, happened? It was time. And I think, you know, God put certain things in place for me to see and say, you know, it's time to move on. Yeah. Um, yeah, not the answer you're looking for. Well, I know. No, I will, I will say this, okay? A lot of people don't know this. I may have said it on the show a couple times with other guests that have participated in this activity, but during the pandemic, I was like freaking out. And uh, my business, my I have a corporate events company, and my business, uh, it was the pandemic. It, it got annihilated in minutes. Like mm-hmm. it was like end of my business instantly and so i saw a lot of the people weed was like selling like crazy so i invested in weed and then it was like going good and then we took a little bit of a legal turn and then i was like oh that illegal turn may not end well. mm. <laughs> so i tried to pull out and i still ended up losing a lot of money i lost a crazy amount of money um but most of it was the profit that I was profit. I was just like kind of letting it sit. So I didn't personally lose as much as I lost my gains. Right. But um, but it was going good. And then it took, like I said, it took a little legal, illegal turn. And then I was like, uh, I don't know. I don't think. And it ended up not ending well. I ended up losing all my money. Damn. So just so you know, I played and I got out. <laughs> and that was my lesson. And let me tell you something. The other people didn't get out as soon as me. And uh, I promise you, they was done for good after that. Huh. They was like, I'm never touching that industry. Because it's very, there's rules, and then it's so easy to, like, fracture it or whatever. It just gets a little, yeah. So that's why I'm, I was out. But I was only in for, like, probably, like, a year. Oh, you know, yeah. Was like, that was quick. I mean, I was nervous the whole time. I, and I was, like, an investor way back here. Way back here. Yeah, but imagine, I mean, so yeah. imagine being hands-on over 10 years. Well, I will tell you this. Some of the stuff I was doing, I can say this because nobody's ever going to, but some of the stuff I was doing was a little illegal. But during the pandemic, I would fly, <laughs> look over at the cameras like, do you want to say this? I would fly money, not over over on the airplanes or whatever. But now, I, I you know, I travel, I, when I had a baby, I realized when you travel with breast milk, they test everything and i realized later like that was very dangerous to fly with money because you know weed money has like weed smell <laughs> right? yeah you're trying it. to be Griselle de blanca I and was, all that. i was during i promise you <laughs> people who know me know that i was like yo i'm getting on this plane and i would you know i would be nervous as hell but i never flew with like nothing crazy like 100k but it was it was still enough to be like you know but then i had a baby and i realized that I was an idiot because with a baby, they like test your breast milk. They're like all like swabbing everything, swabbing the child. I'm like, yo, if only they knew like before the breast milk, yeah. you know, and they, if they would have done that, I would have, we would not be sitting here right yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, that's why I got out. Just so you know, side story. All right. All right. So anyways, you do this business, Um, you exit the- that- Oh, for the minorities and the people that do want to- try to get in it's called social equity license oh really yeah social equity license so if you look into it you can you know i don't know if they're still doing them or if they're still available to apply for but that's what it was so if you have like a beer to entry you can go there and they'll help you get the license yeah you gotta go down to the city city hall social equity license thanks for remembering that Mm -hmm. so after your entrepreneurial thing, is that when hip hop, love and hip hop enters the scene? When what? Love and hip hop enters. Is when what you said? When you're exiting, because you said there was no a space where no, you were. No, I was still, still there. Oh, you were still there. I didn't, I didn't fully get out till 2018, and I, okay. I had a whole case. Well, that was right before the pandemic. Yeah. You said you had a whole what? Case. Case. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have my lawyers and everybody did a great job at keeping that, you know. Okay. Keeping that off off the the news and blogs cuz that really was good. that was a uh, I was I was in court the whole time I was on tour. The reunion tour. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, I was. Oh, wait, so B2K was was back. So you were investing in these business. You were doing this business, but you ended up going back to be you guys reunited for the reunion. We reunited tour. in 2019. Oh, okay. 
<clears throat> so summer 2018 is when I had my whole situation happen. Mm -hmm. And 2019 is when I started going to court for it. And I was in court for like a year. Okay. Yeah. And so every time like, I'm, I'm on stage, I'm like, am I going to jail tomorrow? <laughs> oh, man. So my dance moves is like, faint. Like, <laughs> this might be my last show. <laughs> But and you weren't a dad at the time yet, right? Yes, you were. Yes, so my son was really, nine years old. You were really like stressed. Yeah, 100%. during the reunion tour. Mm -hmm. But you're now at this point, you're also generating money from the tour, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that's going to court. Court, yep, yep, lawyer Dang. fees, all that. Dang. So, what are your pockets looking like during that era? Still good. Still oh, they were good. Still good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I had a lot going on from TV. The shops. It sounds like tour. too. You're also good at managing money at this point. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I wouldn't say I would like. I have never really went broke. <laughs> oh, after after that age, you never went broke again. After. Shit, I never really went broke. Thank <laughs> God. <laughs> Knock on wood. <laughs> you're like not nah, not. Nah, nah. Um. But no. I mean, there's there's, the there's still pandemic, struggles. You know what I mean? There's like still a, struggles okay. and there's. There's just like you said, it's being smart. It's knowing when to to start trimming down. Mm -hmm. You know, trimming the fat. You know, if there's bills that are over here that are unnecessary, you got to cut them off. You know, yeah. You can't go out to go to eat at Mastro's every weekend. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You got to scale back, cook at home. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's just all about being um, like money, conscious of where conscious, you are. Yeah, yeah. You know, and where where you can go. You know, That's not awesome. living beyond your means. So. I would say in the group, you know, we did a lot of that to where if it wasn't for me having money put up like I did for, in my trust, you know, I could have been back out here broke like mm -hmm. that, not knowing where to go mm -hmm. um, or t being able to take the risk that I've taken. Um, so, Were yeah. you the youngest member in the group? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I feel like uh, it's hard sometimes when you're that young and you get exposed to money. I feel like they could be a double-edged sword where you end up never really understanding how money works because mm -hmm. you're used to it coming and right. then maybe disappearing and then coming. And it's in lump sums versus like little. Well, see, my mindset was I was getting the little increments and all the money was going in the trust. Mm -hmm. Then the group broke up and it was broken up for a few months and my trust open. Mm -hmm. Now it was, okay, I have money, but I don't have this group. Mm -hmm. So what am I gonna do? I have to invest. I have to make my money work for me. So then that's, that's when the conversation came with my neighbor and what we're doing with the shop and uh, can we open it? Can I get in? Can I be an investor? How does that look? What mm -hmm. do I need to do? So very it smart. worked out for me. You're very smart, very you. intuitive. Natural entrepreneur, I would say. Thank you. So during, so the 2018, 2019, you have the reunion. Take me to the next milestone in your life. Um, The next milestone would be uh, coming off tour. It was funny because it's like, now I'm done with the whole um, cannabis business, mm -hmm. right? And I'm coming off tour and I'm still in court. And after... I would say maybe six months of being off the road, um, I had my sentencing. And I got off with no jail time, gratefully. Mm -hmm. um, but I had probation and some work release, which is like community service, but like, you know, working on the sides of the freeway, chopping oh, trees, you had to cutting do that? islands, sweeping sand. Yeah, I had a nice time doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so after that, um, once I was free of that and, um, just had to deal with probation, I was figuring out, you know, what's next. Um, obviously love and hip hop wasn't going on anymore, mm -hmm. um, because oh, of the you, pandemic. Oh, okay. But you were, at that point you had already taped it. You had taped at least one season of it. Of love and hip hop. Yeah. Love and hip hop started 2014. Oh, so you were okay, okay, okay. I had done seven seasons of Love and Hip Hop. Oh, wow, okay. Um, so in 2020, when the pandemic was going on, um, 
20, yeah, 2020, the pandemic was happening. I was trying to figure it out, but you know, everybody was in the house. Mm -hmm. um, so I just started kind of diving into everything um, from trying to figure out how to produce shows, um, acting more. I ended up filming a movie, which is actually coming out next month, uh, November 22nd. It's called Run Nixon. It'll be in AMC theaters. Oh yeah, I've seen it on your social medias too. <clears throat> yeah, so um, run Nixon. I did the movie, started acting more, um, learned how to produce. I actually produced on the movie as well. Okay. Um, and I was still doing music here and there, filling it out more of like a hobby. And then I opened a restaurant. I had the opportunity to get to open a restaurant. This is before the pandemic? This is during the pandemic. During the pandemic? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Take me to that. So I, um, a friend of mine, my lawyer, a friend of my lawyers had a, a restaurant. He had multiple restaurants. And being that the pandemic had happened, he didn't want to close them all, but he had to trim down. Mm -hmm. um, so it was an opportunity for me to take over one of the restaurants, which I did. I rebranded it, called it Drew's Louisiana French Quarters. Mm -hmm. um, it was in Westwood, beautiful location right by UCLA. Mm -hmm. um, and I just kind of jumped in it. You know, like I said, it was during the pandemic, so I jumped in it like, let's just see what it does. Yeah. And early, I had a lot of people coming in, but of course it slows down. It's a restaurant. You got to like... It's so many different things that go into a restaurant with marketing and getting people to come in from Yelp reviews, and it's just a whole lot. Mm -hmm. So I'm going through it and trying to figure out how to make turn over a profit. Mm -hmm. Of course, in restaurant businesses, it doesn't happen like that. It takes at least a year or two to break even. Wow. Or so, to even create that stability of understanding that flow, right? Right. Oh, and um, so... My brain and working how it works, <laughs> like mm -hmm. very fast and always trying to figure out the next idea or the next move to keep it going. Um, when I opened the restaurant and I put the restaurant on Grubhub, Uber Eats, DoorDash, I started seeing it like one of my dispensaries. Mm -hmm. So with the dispensaries, I would always promote and put my shops on Weed Maps. Mm -hmm. Weed Maps is a website or an app that gives all the patients and um, customers access to where each of the shops are. And so how it works is you'll go to a, a certain region mm -hmm. in your state and it'll show you all the shops in that region. Mm -hmm. And it's like a list. It looks like Grubhub mm -hmm. or Uber Eats or DoorDash. So when I'm on this and I got my restaurant on there, I said, I wonder if I could do something different with this. And at the time I had seen something called ghost kitchens where people would create these virtual restaurants mm -hmm. and only post it on Grubhub or Uber Eats and you would be able to order it through that, but you couldn't go to a physical location. Oh, I didn't even know that existed. Go on. So when I seen that, I said, that's how I do it. So I basically created five virtual restaurants. Mm -hmm. um, one was called LA Soul Tacos. Mm -hmm. I had Drew's Louisiana, of course, which was the actual standing restaurant. Um, I had Maxwell's Polish Dogs. Mm -hmm. I had Veggie Buns, which was all vegetarian food. Mm -hmm. And then I had, uh, what was the last one? Yeah, um, you came up with all this on your own. Yeah. Okay. And um, damn, what was the other restaurant? It was one more restaurant I had. Oh, uh, Go Wings. Not Wing Stop, Go Wings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so I had those five restaurants, and I had them all on Grubhub, DoorDash, Uber Eats. Uh, what's the other one? Grubhub, DoorDash, Uber Eats, and... Um, DoorDash? No. I said DoorDash, oh, DoorDash Grubhub, 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 Uber Eats. Uber Eats. And it's one more. Uh, Basically, all the food apps. So uh -huh. I took all the food apps. I put all my restaurants. And on these the food are all apps. ghost. Most of them, all four, four of them are, are ghost, ghost kitchens. kitchens. Okay. Except one. Okay. So now 
not only are you going to these apps to order food, you're ordering from five of my restaurants. Mm -hmm. So now I'm not banking on one restaurant. Mm -hmm. I'm banking on five different ones with five different foods. And in five different ghost locations. In one location. But one location, but the ghost location could be anywhere, right? I mean, like no. when they pull it up on the map, are they is it close to their house? The ghost location gives you an address to pick for the the oh, delivery okay. drivers to pick the food up. Oh, okay. They would come to Drew's, Louisiana. Wow. So instead of banking on Drew's, Louisiana to do what I needed to do, now I'm getting five calls for this restaurant, 20 for this one, 15 Smart. for this one. And it got to be so much mm -hmm. that I overwhelmed myself. Oh. And now I'm in there helping the cooks cook myself. No. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, bro, I didn't sign up for this. Like, yeah. it's a great idea. It's doing what it's supposed to do. But this is a lot of work. I'm going to the restaurant depot, buying, um, running out of this. Sour cream might about to be about to expire. <laughs> and I got the health department coming tomorrow. And I got to have everything in it in there with no expiration dates, all good expiration dates. Um, I got to make sure the meats are frozen, the fish is frozen, it's in the freezer. This part, like, it was a lot to deal with. And I'm doing it dolo with a few employees. So... Nice. Building it up, building it up. It's getting better. But then the pandemic hit back again. We had the second rise the in The second COVID. year, yeah. And Jeez. I was in the UCLA health building. Mm -hmm. And they came down and were like, got to shut down the food in here. Why? Well, one thing was for sure. Um, I didn't feel it. I felt a certain way about getting a vaccine and a lot oh, of my yeah, employees yeah. didn't want to get it. So being yeah, that yeah. we weren't vaccinated, they like, y'all got to get out this building. Get out. So, But what an amazing... Okay, I just have to highlight this pivot because uh, my favorite person to interview on this show is entrepreneurs, believe it or not. It's like if I have to choose between celebrities, influencers, and entrepreneurs, I'm all, I'm all about entrepreneurs. But your pivot game... Being hand like taking over this business, but figuring out a way to create more business and market it was simply outstandingly genius. <laughs> like I'm gonna take that and make it into a clip and send it to like, you know, hopefully restaurants and everybody <laughs> takes game because that is the most genius, innovative thing I've ever heard. Thank and you. even when you pay attention to the way uh, you did it, I gotta highlight this. You chose different types of food. You chose yeah. wings. You chose veggies. Like you covered all the basics of. And is did you actually think about that? Like yeah, covering all the mm -hmm. that is because not everybody eats to, seafood. Not well, everybody eats veggie food. Not but everybody were you eats not Polish impressed dogs. With your own. Oh, this is my mind works like this. But all were day. you not sitting there like? I would have been calling my thing is like, just guess like, how much of a G I am? Look what I did. <laughs> like <laughs> you don't do that. Nah, nah, I do that if I have a simple. Hack and I feel like I like somehow cracked the code on geniusness. I would be texting all my friends like, "Yo, you'll never guess what I was able to accomplish," and you didn't do that. That's amazing. Mm, I'm you. the opposite. I would have been <laughs> fucking Billboard of the year. I'd be right no, in my mouth. More but that's so, my circle's real small, and then it's like, if my boys hit me and it's like, "Yo, man, what's what you doing with this? This is super dope. Can I get in?" I'm always, "Yeah, come on, wow, let's do it." But that was that. It was probably the most dopest pivot game I've ever seen. <laughs> and it was during the pandemic. You yeah. really had to think out of the box. Some people will quit, believe it or not. A lot right. of people will quit under that type of pressure. And a lot of people wouldn't be running around, you know, trying to find the sour cream or whatever. So kudos to you. You're like <laughs> so extreme entrepreneur. Right. So exciting. I did not know that about you. So I'm really more hyped right now. Appreciate but you. that's cool. All right. So... Take so keep going with your story. Um, <laughs> um, man, there's so many things. Uh, after that, I had a home that I bought in um in Porter Ranch, and I leased it out. Um, because I was running everything like with the restaurants, we ended up closing that down, and at that time I have my home, I'm helping my mom's with her home, and um, now I have to figure out ways to scale down, trim back. Mm -hmm. So I leased out my house, um, got something a little smaller, 
And I was in a space of trying to figure out what was next. So I, uh, like I said, during the pandemic, besides the restaurant and music and film, I was also learning to produce. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to figure out a way to produce a show, but one that made sense. And I wanted to do something that involved my son because now my son is older and he's controlling my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so- What do you mean, scare me? Tell me, what does that mean? So every day, of course, there's school. Mm -hmm. But then after school, there's basketball practice. After practice, or before basketball practice, there's basketball training. After training, there's practice. Then we're back home. Then we're homework and study. Then I'm dinner, cooking dinner. Mm -hmm. Then I'm and you're, doing you're up, you're like a up. single dad, right? Hundred percent. Well, kind, you're, well right, right. me and his mom are joint okay, joint okay. custody. So, um, mostly every other week, you know, okay. he's with me, but. Um, I'm the dad and he's in puberty stage, so yeah. I'm he's with me now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you can go mom wants to see you, you wanna see mom, hang out, go, y'all do y'all thing. You know what I'm saying? I'm never gonna not let you see your mother. You know what yeah. I'm saying? You always see your mom, but in these crucial stages you need to be with me. Yeah. You know? So Every day, um, from the type of school he goes to a prep school, mm -hmm. I drop him off at the gym in the morning. They train for three hours. Then they get bused to school in a sprinter van. Then they have lunch. Then they do school for three hours. No homework. After that, we're training. After mm -hmm. training, he has practice two times a week. After that, it's games on the weekend, tournaments, okay. far out. He's definitely controlling you. Your life is him. Him, 100%. Now, just to backtrack a little bit, I know we talked about your mom. Um, you are very much, even when you watch Love and Have Help, you see you're a very vested dad. Is mm. there, what is your relationship with your dad? Is there a reason why you're, I'm not saying all men aren't vested, but I'm just no, saying for sure. it, it's definitely noticeable. Um, well, I didn't meet my father till I was 13. Okay. So I always had this thing where I had a, a vision of, what a father looked like mm -hmm. and what I wanted my father to be like. And I made a promise to myself, you know, if I ever have a kid or something, he's never gonna experience what I experienced growing up and wanting and trying to imagine what it's like to have a father in his life. Okay. So when he got here, I just, that was already okay. set in stone. Like, I'm, this is my son, you yeah. know? Regardless, like, I'm gonna be there. Okay. No matter what, I'll go broke. <laughs> I'll eat while broke <laughs> as long as I'm in his life. You okay. know what I'm saying? So um, trying to figure it out, what's next? And like I said, everything is basketball. Mm -hmm. I'm in the gym with him 24-7. So I'm noticing one night, I'm, I'm telling him, yo, turn the TV off, go to bed. So I walk in his room, he was asleep. And I go to turn the TV off, and it was this YouTube show he watches. And all these shows he watches on YouTube are based on basketball, from a channel called Overtime Elite to Ball is Life to Switch Cultures. Just everything you could think of basketball-related, he's watching. But this particular night, he has on um, a show on Overtime called Fear Nothing. It's a show based on Mikey Williams' journey. Um, from high school basketball to wherever he's going, mm -hmm. um, and I, he watches this. He watched this show a whole lot at this time, and I looked at it and I had this thing just hit my brain, and I said, "That's it." Oh, sorry, mm -hmm. I said, "That's it. That's what I need. That's what I need to produce a show based on youth high school basketball that doesn't just highlight one player." but highlights all of the kids and gives it like a sports center fitly mm -hmm. to where they could watch this and feel like I might be on here tonight. Yeah. Cause they don't have that. Mm -hmm. So I created this show called Youth Got Game. Youth Got Game. And they can get it on YouTube or? Yeah. Okay. So um, our first episodes will be coming out in the next month or so. Okay. But um, just got into that and started networking got the right people on the team, and now we'll be hosting like all the top Nike tournaments. Wow. Um, all the, so it's like May Hoops Camps, mm -hmm. we'll be hosting those. 
Um, is your son really tournaments. like proud and excited about what you were able to do? Just it's kind of like he inspired this, right? So, so, so does he say it or does he talk about it or? No, nah, not he, really. Okay. He's just focused on playing the game. He want to <laughs> see himself on the show. Okay, okay, he knows that with me, he gonna have to work really hard and do what he's supposed to do. It's not gonna just be, oh, you're my son. I'm putting you on. Okay, okay. So it's more of a challenge now. It's, I put him up to the challenge. He accepted it. You okay. know, so we got to put in the work. Okay, I um, like that. But um, yeah, so put together uh, that show. We got a couple big things coming up for us. We're doing a camp in uh, Charlotte okay. um, with this company, Cyber Athletics. You're doing a basketball camp? Camp, yeah. Okay, cool. We'll be hosting it, our podcast. Okay. Um, Wait, the show is a podcast and a... It's so a I guess I'm kind of visioning like reality slash... It's a live podcast. podcast. It's a live podcast. Yeah. Okay, got it. Um. And we have guests on the show, mm -hmm. you know, from younger athletes mm -hmm. to coaches to mm -hmm. referees to professional past and future NBA players. I love it. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. So that's what that's what I've been on now. Okay. And um, in the process of that, I actually took on a team. I created a, a travel team for my son mm -hmm. because we were doing all these games and we were with a couple programs that I felt like could be doing more and not necessarily be much as much of a money grab. Um so I ended up starting my own team <laughs> and got um all my son's friends who I know could really hoop mm -hmm. and one of my friends who coaches high school basketball and put them all together. We started a team, East West Prospects, and um we went this summer and smashed through all the tournaments, won all of them that we joined, wow. literally. And I had a bunch of sixth graders turning seventh graders who played against eighth and ninth graders, mm -hmm. and we were winning everything. Wow. So that started happening. I started getting calls from like top program directors from uh, Compton Magic, a Why Not. Uh, these are programs ran by, um, these are top programs that were put together that are sponsored by like Adidas and Nike yeah. and NBA players like Why Not is Russell Westbrook program. Um, Compton Magic is a staple in LA. It's been around since I was a kid, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and they have players who've come from their programs to play professional basketball who are in the NBA today. So all these programs are calling me now, trying to combine. Mm -hmm. And um, one to of get my, behind East West. Yeah. Wow. So one of my friends um, that I knew since I was like 17, 18, he's a uh, cousins with Paul George mm -hmm. and he runs the program for Paul George Elite and we had talked and we was like yo man um, I want you to bring your boy like how much it gonna cost me to get your boy back over here talking about my son mm -hmm. and I'm like man let's you know let's have a conversation let's talk and see what we can come up with and basically he gave me the keys to run the seventh grade program at Paul George Elite so now we're sponsored by Nike playing on all the top platforms. So, but does your son leave your East West team to? So East West is now Paul George oh, Elite. Okay, so now it's, it's official. So you guys have been accepted as an official under yeah. that umbrella. Yep. Okay, so son is still on the team. Damn, I want to watch these games. <laughs> you got me hyped. So, um, yep, we did that and, mm -hmm. you know, constantly filming on them as mm -hmm. well, highlighting them. And then is it hard to get all those parental clearances or is it like everyone, you you built such a good rapport with everybody that everyone's with just their... signing releases? So clearances I, for what? Oh, I thought you you highlight the kids on the show. I will if they're doing their thing, oh, you know okay, what I'm okay. saying? But that anybody can be highlighted. Okay. It doesn't have, I don't need parental oh, I, didn't, I don't know. Uh, thing I was just to highlight somebody's kid that's doing what they should be doing on the court. Yeah, you know, that's yeah. just giving them more exposure. Yeah. Um, and we're not charging, you know, for that. Like this is, hey, if I think you're hot, you doing what you need to do, you look good on the court and you eating, Yeah. let's highlight you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like a lot of kids put in a lot of work in basketball that we don't see, mm -hmm. you know, from the kid that doesn't have the travel team that plays at the park and he's there every single day and might be there by himself and, and he just played one game in a recreation league and might put up 50 points and you'll never hear about it, but now you're watching Youth Got Game and you'll see it. Wow.
you know like yeah. we're we're diving in deep from everywhere across the from across every the angle globe. wow yeah. okay Okay, so you're even getting the ones that like can't afford to be in the clinics. 100%. I love that. Mm -hmm. And then I I know you're thinking about opening your own clinic down the road, right? As far as like camps? For, yeah, camps. Yeah, we'll probably do something for sure. Yeah, I'll definitely see that mm -hmm. in your future. It'll happen. It's definitely going to happen. <laughs> so what's the next milestones for you after that? Because I think we're current, right? You brought me to yeah. current. So now that's where we are. So. Um and um, some more exciting things, um, putting together a podcast along with Boog and Raz. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where are you guys? You guys should come here and take. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll take yeah, care yeah, of y'all. Yeah, yeah. I let you. I let you see when we when we mm -hmm. when we drop the the teaser on. Okay. You know, oh, you guys already about. started recording it and everything. We let you see. It, you what? Know, the style the style. I'm gonna call just, Raz. Just, just be you like, see. you don't tell me enough. <laughs> he called. I think Raz calls me. Almost once a day now. Uh, I'm not even gonna lie; it's probably five times a day. And I talk to I talk to him and Blue every single day, you know. And and they've been on their journeys as well. Mm -hmm. Raz is super smart, networking, and tied into a lot of different things mm -hmm. um, that brings so much value to what we're doing. And he's Blug. also done the. Uh, I feel like he's also been teaching me a little. I mean, I'm not good at it, but he also worked on his mental health, and he'll be like dropping like yeah. like smart gems. I For mean, sure. I'd be like, I wish I was like that. He'd be like, you can be like that. I'd be like, well, I'm not there yet, but you know. What? But yeah, he's worked on his mental health too, which I think a lot of people don't talk about working on that no, in addition sure. to everything. That's, that's really big of him, man. I salute him for that, for sure. Um, mm -hmm. He's doing really good. And you know, and Boog is still working in films, mm -hmm. doing films. So us all coming together and creating what we put together is pretty dope. So it was like B2K coming back. Or should we be anticipating? Because you know, you're, you're, you're talking a lot. Things. We're going to see some things okay. coming, you know. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I'm pretty sure your fan base is still rock solid and loyal. And uh, they're going to be anticipating the days to, to <laughs> see the reunion. For sure. For sure. Now, how can everybody keep up with you? We could talk directly to this camera. Okay. How can everybody keep up with everything you have going on and then break down the, the youth Youth got game. Youth got game. Everything individually. <laughs> no, for sure. Um, well, first and foremost, you can you know check out my Instagram, Air Fizzo. Um, same with the threads, Air Fizzo. It's A I R Fizzo. Yep, F I Z Z O. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, check out my movie coming to AMC theaters November twenty second. Run Nixon. Um, really excited about that. And what's Run Nixon about? <laughs> Run Nixon. Um, I'm a single father. Well, no, I'm sorry. I'm a father of a ten year old boy who has a heart condition. Um, his mother's a stripper, and one day she drops him off to his game. I get there. He plays basketball. I get there, and he has a heart attack on the court. He's suffering from. Um, forget what the heart disease is called, but basically he needs a heart transplant immediately or he won't survive. And our insurance doesn't cover it. So his mother takes matters into her own hands and robs a drug dealer from the strip club she works at. Oh, wow. He gets home, he puts clues together, figures out who did it and why, and he kidnaps our son and I have to figure out how to get him back. Oh, this sounds crazy intense. Yeah, we got to yeah. see this movie in theaters. <laughs> it's going right. to be lit. And then what else can we uh, look forward to? And then um, look forward to seeing, you know, me, my boy CJ. Y'all can follow him on Instagram, Coach CJ underscore 23. Um, we'll be highlighting all these kids, man. Youth Got Game. Check out youthgotgame.com. Mm -hmm. um, Youth Got Game Instagram page. Um yeah, it's it's gonna be crazy, man. You might be the next kid on Youth Got Game. You never know. I love that Just you're supporting balling. the youth. Yes, man. All right, guys. Well, thank you for feeding me. I can finally finish this bag of Fritos <laughs> uh, without chewing in your ears. Thanks for staying tuned. Check out another episode on e of Eating While Broke wherever you listen to your podcast. Yes, yes. Peace.